Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so basically, we have this IC on uh, calculation dilemma. But before we start that, uh, I'll just finish my uh, faculty talk on uh, experience with value segment FACO surgery. So the thing is, whenever a person you know joins his first job or he's just started working, uh, and there'll be a time where he has to you know buy a car. And when he buys a car, it would be wise if he goes for a car which is more uh, value for money and more cost effective as compared to taking a big loan and taking a sports car. Very similarly, even for a, a medical or a medical student, uh, he's just finished his degree and he's uh, starting to work. It's not a good idea to go for a very expensive FACO machine. It's better to start off with something that is more affordable and more economical and value for money again. So there are many uh, machines in the market, uh, but personally, uh, one of the best machines which I feel is the Legion system. Do not uh, judge the, uh, uh, the size by the size of its performance. Performance is simply amazing. As you can see here, uh, I'm doing a quadrant removal in a NS3 to NS4 uh, grade cataract, and the pieces just disappear in just a few seconds. The complete, uh, you know, uh, the quadrant removal is done. I know it looks like the, the speed at which it's going, it looks like it's a soft cataract. Believe me, it's a very hard cataract. So the question is, why Legion FACO system? Actually, it is, why not? Because the Legion has advanced uh, gravity-based FACO system. Uh, the chamber stability is good. Cutting efficiency with the ozone technology is excellent, as you, uh, as you saw in the video. Uh, it's a very compact and portable. And most importantly, for the performance it's delivering, it's extremely, extremely affordable. Coming to the uh, fluid management system, uh, it has a dual segment pump, uh, which uh, creates a very stable flow. It has a, a rotary valve and irrigation valve, which uh, creates a very uh, minimal valve surge. It has a 2D bar a barcode for which uh, for the sensor calibration, and also it has an optical and ir uh, irrigation uh, sensors. Now, when you look at the torsional technology, if you see the pieces, I don't know if you can see my cursor. Oh, yeah, it's visible, right. If you see the, the front part of the FACO tip, um, you can see the pieces coming towards the tip, which is very important for the, uh, you know, the fallibility. Uh, and, and, uh, and also because of this technology, the amount of heat generated is lesser, and also there is lesser cavitation bubbles, so that it gives, it creates a very nice environment for you to do your uh, FACO surgery in peace. But when you look at the dog rule power, let's say if, the, if it is at 100%, if you look at the particles in front of the FACO tip, it is pushing away from the tip. So this is what I'm sure each one of you have realized when you put excessively or excessive, when you apply excessive longitudinal uh, power, the pieces go away from the tip, which is counteractive to what you're actually doing. So I wanted to share a few tips and tricks how to perform a, a good a good FACO chop or a FACO uh, quadrant removal. So these are few tips which uh, I'm sharing with you. Uh, one of the most important thing is the right FACO settings. Um, I think because of shortage of time, I can't, cannot share the settings with you uh, for this talk. But in terms of uh, technique, the angulation is very important. Initially, when you angulate uh, the tip onto the lens, always have a 40 de 45 degree angle. The next thing is impaling the tip into the lens. See, if you observe here, I make sure the tip is completely disappears into the, uh, the into the lens before I initiate my chop. Now, the other thing is, once you have got a good hold with your FACO tip, do not move your FACO tip. Keep it still. This is very, very important. Otherwise, you create an hydrogenic uh, breaks of the zonules. If you see here, once I've got a good hold, my FACO tip does not move. Only my chopper moves. I can show you here again, my FACO tip doesn't move, only the chopper moves. This is very, very important. The next thing is, how do I move the FACO chip, or I mean, a FACO, I mean FACO chopper, or uh, how do I chop the right way? See, a lot of people do different techniques. See, you don't need to do long strokes, means take the chopper to the periphery, take a long stroke, and then chop it. Keep it very simple and nice. Just take the chopper just in front of the tip, and then pull it towards the tip, and then then move it sideways, okay? I'll just show you how that works. Um, the video is playing. Yeah. So you can see here, I'm just placing in front of the tip, towards the tip, sideways. Front of the tip, 
towards the tip and then sideways. Just a very simple way. It is something like holding a paper. If you hold the paper too far apart and try to tear it, it is not possible. If you hold the paper next to, uh, next to I mean, keep both your fingers next to each other and then t uh, tear the paper, it tears immediately. So it's very, very important. So the next thing is only in soft cataract. Okay, this is the only time when you move your phaco tip also, you have to move it forward while you're chopping and then sideways and the chopper, you have to do a longer strokes in this, okay? With the chopper, you take a long stroke and a very deep stroke when you bring it towards the tip. Now, what is the key thing in this is when you're bringing it towards the tip, it should be a quick movement and when you're going sideways, should be a very slow movement. This is very, very important thing. So as you can see, this is a very soft cataract. I'm a very deep uh, chop towards the tip and I move it very slowly sideways. So the chop happens. Yes, in soft cataracts, you can still do a direct chop. It's just about the technique. It's more of a mechanical. I'm not using too much vacuum. It's under irrigation itself. And you can see the chop happens every single time. Now, what about in very hard cataracts? See, separation is very important. As you can see, uh, when you separate these pieces, first you separate the superficial layer, then you release, take the dialer more deeper, then separate, then release, go deeper and separate. So let's have a look. See, this is a black cataract which you can see. So initial chop, I separate the superficial layer, then take the dialer more deeper, separate, deeper, and then separate. This way you will get a complete chop through and through. Doesn't matter what the grade of cataract, it's very, very easy. The next thing is, let's say if you are a surgeon who's who always does divide and conquer, Please do not rely on the glow to feel like you have reached the right depth. Please, I think this is something that we all have to stop teaching and doing also. It is important to look at the fibers of the arrangement, so, okay? So let's look at it. Now, if you can see the uh, fiber arrangement in the trench, it is perpendicular to the trench. I hope everyone can see. It is perpendicular to the trench. Now, but if I move this forward, uh, I can't see the cursor. Okay, anyway, uh, let the movie, uh, so once I keep trenching, so you can see the fiber arrangement suddenly changes. Now you can see it, now I'm trying to zoom in and focus. Can you see the fiber arrangements? It is along the trench. So once it's along the trench, that means you've reached the right depth, stop, and then divide, you should get a good job. Next thing is uh, quadrant removal. Is you finished all your chopping, you're trying to bring the piece to the center. What is very important is you're trying to hold and bring it to the center, right? Please do not press maximum three at this point because if you press maximum three, you just eat up the piece, you're not trying to hold it and bring it to the center. The next thing is avoid to push the lens when you're trying to press three and two and hold it. What does that mean is, see, do not do this like where you push it like this and then press step three and two. This will 100% lead to a PCR. More than just touch the lens and then press 3, 2, the piece will come to you, okay? Do not push it. Please remember this. Why you should not push it is because if you push it, the phaco tip is extremely close to the posterior capsule, and when you press 3, 2, immediately there's a PCR and you had it. So remember this small tip. The next thing is, while I'm still fine, in the sense whenever uh, you press 3, after you've brought the piece to the center, you're going to press 3, right? First thing is you have to make sure the, uh, the chamber is stable, the next thing is, before you press 3, make sure the tip is in the center. It's in the iris plane. Do not move the tip. Uh, you know, some surgeons, some of us keep uh, shaking the tip while we press 3. Please do not do that. And then uh, make sure the irrigation ports of the phaco tip is in the, uh, in the chamber. And always remove your second instrument. When you remo remove your second instrument, it creates a very uh, fantastic fluidics within the chamber. That means there's only one inlet and one outlet. The inlet is through the irrigation ports and the outlet is through the phaco tip. But if you have a second instrument, sometimes the wound is leaking. So there's some amount of outlet is going through that. So the pieces sometimes get confused and it doesn't, you know, the flow is not that great. So you can see here again, so I bring it to the center, press three, it disappears. Again, I bring it to the center, step three. And you, if you, I don't know if you have observed, I do not push and bring it to the center. It's almost touch and the pieces come to me. So we did a study where we compared uh, the Legion with the other uh, other FACO systems. This was a prospective randomized comparative uh, double mass uh, single study. This is the inclusion exclusion criteria. All the detailed examination was done. Time was tracked at different steps of the surgeries. And uh, specular and central corneal thickness was uh, documented preoperatively and postoperatively. We had about 100 uh, patients uh, of Legion group and then we have 100 from the other eye. And we had a list of questionnaires which was given to a surgeon where the surgery was masked and the surgeon was told to assess the 
you know, uh, in terms of uh, the fallibility of the nucleus, ease of chopping, and so on and so forth. So the grading is very, uh, the, you know, it's by us, and the surgeon doesn't know which machine is being operated on. So if you look at the grading, let's say for an example, when you look at the ease of quadrant removal, grade one, we say there was difficulty in all the steps. In, in grade two, there was difficulty in removing the quadrants of one or two, st uh, one or two quadrants. And uh, grade three is removing all the quadrants was super, super easy. So when you look at the results, there was a significant lesser ultrasound time uh, in the Legion group as compared to the other. And also the total case time, the total time taken for the surgery was significantly lesser in the Legion group. Uh, the Legion group also had lesser central corneal thickness, difference between preoperative and postoperative, but it was not significant. And there was no difference between specular microscopy between the two groups. Now, when you look at the, uh, the different performance of the machine in different steps, there was a significant, uh, the Legion performed significantly better in all the steps from fallibility, quadrant removal, so and so forth in terms of surge control, everything. So to summarize, uh, Legion had a significantly lesser uh, ultrasound time and case time. Legion group had lesser central corneal th uh, thickness before and uh, after the surgery, uh, but it was not significant. Uh, Legion performed better in all steps of uh, FACO investigation when compared to the other FACO machines. Thank you for your time. Can everyone hear me? Fantastic. So, so let's begin our uh, IC on uh, calculation dilemma. See, all of us have, uh, at least most of us have chosen uh, the medical field thinking that, no, I'm very bad in maths. And, uh, and finally, we join medicine by the time you finish medicine and finally you realize you still have to know a little bit. So uh, here we are, we are trying to calculate uh, the different, uh, you know, IOLs, what is, how do we correct the astigmatism, and so on and so forth. So it's a very informative uh, IC. I think uh, for, a, for a first talk, Dr. Roeta will be starting, uh, uh, will be talking about the topic, IOL power calculation in cataract with keratoconus. Dr. Roeta, please. Thank you. Uh, today I shall talk on IOL power calculation in cataract with keratoconus. Just a few points. Keratoconus is a progressive disorder characterized by thinning and protrusion of the cornea, resulting in decreased visual acuity and irregular astigmatism. The basic criteria all of us know is the Rabinovitz uh, uh, index, which uh, has the central steepening of around 47 point, more than 47.2, and the difference between the inferior and uh, superior will be more than 1.2, and a steep radial axis queuing of more than 22 degrees. The other commonest classification is the Amsler uh, classification, which is based on the amount of astigmatism, the, the, basically the refraction, the central K readings, presence or absence of scarring, and the corneal thickness. There are a lot of other classifications, but it is out of scope for this discussion. What, what we should look for? Initially, I shall tell a few points about the pentacam, only basic points. That is the inferior steepening, posterior elevation of more than 17 microns, anterior elevation of uh, more than 12 microns. Coming to the Bellin Ambrosia display, we have the first two maps showing us the anterior and the posterior elevation, which is based on the best fit sphere. The second two maps shows us the enhanced uh, best fit sphere, the elevation based on that. And the last two maps shows us the difference between these two. We all know the dependence of uh, keratoconus patient on the contact lenses, but chronic usage of contact lens causes uh, warpage, which will interfere with our uh, topography. There is no hard and fast rule to uh, uh, each surgeon differs with the contact lens holiday, which is uh, required for all the calculation. This is just a rough guide which can be followed. Coming to the role of corneal epithelium, we all know corneal epithelium remodeling actually happens at the uh, area of stromal thinning. Reinstall et al. have uh, done a lot of study on this and they've shown that in keratoconus, the thinning of the epithelium is present in areas of relative increase in wherever the cornea is very steep 
and wherever it is relatively flatter, it actually thickens. Basically, the uh, inferior paracentral region. So the, that is why the epithelial profile in KC will be basically a donut shape. So in case the corneal epithelium is regu irregular, we uh, based with the trehalose uh, based lubricant eye drops and treatment of any dry eye, we try to regularize it. Trehalose is used even after sometimes after KXL because it increases the uh, epithelial uh, remodeling which can happen. When we should operate in the KC, any visually significant cataract, age more than 40 years, it is a uh, uh, not a uh, important criteria because even if it is significant in a lesser than 40 year old, we have to go ahead. And in case the patient is less than 40 years, we need to explain the chances of progression. And the most important thing is uh, having a stable keratoconus where the corneal uh, K-max is less than one diopter difference between uh, at least for a period of six months. This is our approach. First, we have to find out whether the KC is stable. If it is st uh, not stable, we do epithelial mapping. And if it is irregular or thickened, we give them uh, a month's treatment of on a trellose-based lubricant. If uh, to regularize it, either uh, if we see whether the cone is centered or decentered and uh, act accordingly and the details of the whole discussion uh, about the treatment and approach for keratoconus treatment is out of scope for this discussion. This is what is required in, uh, for a cataract surgeon we, uh, based on the severity of the KC. If it is a mild KC of less than 48 diopters, we can actually use the K value for all our calculation and uh, target a low myopia. If the axial length is uh, more than, less than uh, 25 millimeters or wide to wide is less than 12.5, we can plan toric or monofocal. If it is a larger axial length or if the wide to wide is large, meaning that the bag is larger, we may need to consider a, to a CTR if a toric is planned. In cases of severe uh, K, we can plan a toric, uh, but it has to be customized toric. And if there is a, a very severe scarring and uh, uh, we are unable to acquire proper scan results, we can use the standard K. So coming to why are IL calculation in keratoconus so challenging? First is we are here dealing with the very irregular astigmatism. That is the ratio between the central K and the paracentral K is uh, 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 not regular. The causing tear film abnormalities which uh, leads to poor repeatability of all the biometric uh, findings. Most of these patients have a, not only a difficult K, they have longer axial lengths and they have a very deep anterior chamber. All this causes a hyperopic uh, uh, estimation of the IL power with normal biometry. Coming to assumptions. In, for normal IL calculation, the assumption between the anterior and the posterior corneal curvature, that's the, basically the Gullstein ratio which is supposed to be 82%, is not uh, according uh, in keratoconus. So because of uh, posterior thinning, this ratio is altered. One more thing is normal corneal uh, refractive index is 1.376, but we use a keratometric index of 1.3375 for all our IL calculations. And this keratometric index will also be altered because of posterior corneal thinning, which leads us to the second most important thing is measuring the posterior cornea. So, <clears throat> these are the two common instruments which can be used. This is the IL Master 700, which gives us the posterior uh, cornea, which also measures the posterior cornea, and the Pentacam, which measures the posterior cornea. Pentacam gives us different K readings. It gives us the same K. It gives us true net power, total corneal refractive power. Here we should note that SIM-K is the only one which uses the refractive index of 1.3375 and so can be used in all older IOL calculations. Whereas the TNP and the TCRP, they are based on the actual corneal refractive index of 1.376 
and therefore cannot be used. Coming to the holiday EKR report which gives us the zonal K readings, this is based on refractive index of 1.3375 and therefore the central 4 to 4.5 millimeter zone uh, K can be used for our IL calculations. Coming to TK or the total keratometry on IL master, it gives us both the anterior and the posterior curvature. The anterior is measured by telecentric keratometry, whereas the posterior cornea, it is measured by a swept source OCT. It doesn't directly give us the uh, posterior and anterior algebraic sum. It actually modifies what it calculates for the posterior with an algorithm and changes the posterior K to the refractive index of 1.3375 so that it can be directly used for our IL calculations. The advantages of IL master is repeatability of the scans and, and the rapid acquisition of the scans. Both the eye, both eye scans can be done in less than 45 seconds. Coming to choosing the right IL formulas, I hope everyone knows who are these people. Coming to the basic two variable formula that is the SRKT formula. SRKT uh, has been found with in many studies to actually give us uh, better results than other older generation formulas because of its inherent design flaw. That is, in normal eyes, it actually gives a myopic shift. As we all know, in keratoconus, we have a hyperopic IL biometry. It just compensates for the thing where Haig is called as to be a cusp phenomena. Coming to IL formulas, which are specifically designed for KC, is the Kane keratoconus, the Barrett 2K KC, and the Holiday 2K KC. I shall talk about the first two. The Holiday is a paid software. Coming to Barrett True K formula. The Barrett True K is basically based on the universal two, but where T, uh, True K is, is modification for post-refractive eyes. KC is also quite similar to uh, post-refractive eyes in a way that the anterior and the posterior uh, uh, ratio is altered. This uh, formula uses a double K method to improve the ELP, that is, it uses the measured K for IL calculation and a theoretical K to derive the ELP. It employs the, uh, even in true K KC, it employs the measured posterior cornea. In case we have biometry which do not give us a posterior cornea, we can use the theoretical prediction and ent enter only the anterior K values. It is more conservative than Kane KC because it is closer to uh, IOL recommendations which uh, is given without KC adjustment. The mathematical formula for this calculation is not yet published. In, if you go to ASCRS website and uh, uh, try, the keratoconus does not appear in the drop down menu. We need to go to APACRS website to find the drop-down menu. Coming to Kane formula, Kane formula, a lot of studies have shown that it is the more accurate over all other modern formulas. It is based on a regression analysis of a large data sets and artificial intelligence and theoretical optics and uses even the con cent uh, uh, CCT and the gender for IL calculation. The difference between Kane formula to Kane keratoconus formula is in Kane keratoconus he uses the anterior corneal radii of curvature to derive a modified corneal power. We have to enter the anterior corneal values and it theoretically derives the net corneal power. In the carat uh, this can be uh, uh, got from iolformulae.com. And the K1 and K2, can, up to 65 diopters can be entered in uh, Kane uh, formula, while as uh, in Barrett True K, it is up to 60 diopters. There is a target uh, refraction to be set. For less than 48, you can keep it unchanged. For up to 59, around minus 1 can be the target refraction. 
and more than 59 up to 2.5 can be the target refraction. In advanced keratoconus or in areas uh, where we are, scan acquisition is uh, difficult or in scarred corneas, we can use the keratometry from the other eye or use standard K values for IL calculation. Coming to which IL would you choose? We all know that the central cornea is steeper than the peripheral cornea, which gives us a prolate cornea, which has a Q value, which is negative. In keratoconus, this Q value is altered and becomes more negative. So uh, we need a IOL which is at least a zero, a positive, uh, zero or a positive spherical aberration. Coming to toric IOL keratoconus, in mild to moderate keratoconus with a relatively regular central uh, astigmatism, toric IELs can be uh, uh, given as a choice. And in patients with whose vision can improve for more than 6 by 12, we have to tell the patient that it is just an astigmatic debulking procedure and we cannot correct the total uh, uh, astigmatism. We have to watch for progression after cataract surgery. And one main thing to notice, if the patient is already happy with the scleral contact lens and with the RGP, please do not provide toric, give them monofocal and correct the residual with the scleral lens and RGP lens. Because they are used to some lens being on the cornea than in front or behind. Full. This is a case example. So, 55 year old who with grade 1 NS to PSC. We can see the inferior steepening in the first graph. The posterior elevation is around 98 microns and the anterior is around 23 microns. The EKR is giving us a reading of 47 and 51. Coming to epithelial mapping, we can see that the cornea here is quite regular. The IL master K is around 50 and 58. So these are the comparisons where anterior K, SIM K and the EKR. Barrett through K using the K, anterior K from the IL master and the biometry, it is giving us a plus 8.5. Whereas Kn using the same parameters gives us a plus 10.5. It is always better to give, go in for a higher IL power because it at least gives us a myopic uh, target or even if it overcorrects, it will give us a residual myopia, which is good. And the, any residual uh, refractive cylinder can be corrected with the scleral contact lens, which the patient was already using. Thank you. So, um, yeah, meanwhile, uh, till Dr. Aishwarya comes on stage. See, uh, w one of the things which, uh, while treating Casey, uh, some of us, what we do is we look at the book. No, no, we have to look at, uh, you know, refraction stability and then do the surgery, cataract surgery. Please do not have that in mind because refraction stability, you cannot have that as a factor in when the patient already has cataract. <coughs> because of the cataract, the refraction will keep changing. So don't keep that into consideration. Always uh, look for the scans, look for the repeatability of the scans. Once you do multiple scans and multiple scans, it looks like it's not changing. That is, these are all th things which I'm telling about in young patients. In older patients, anyway, usually the 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 KC is already stable, uh, so you don't have to worry about it. Uh, to just uh, Dr. Rohita's uh, talk, basically, if you have a KC, you uh, grade the severity, and uh, only in severe cases you you can use a standard K. Otherwise, you go with the actual case. And uh, among the formulas, Kane does extremely well. IOL Master, even if you are not comfortable with Kane, it's okay. IOL Master does a fantastic job. And one of the questions which normally we keep getting is, uh, uh, see, I don't have a machine which measures the actual K, uh, I mean, uh, the posterior cornea, like the TK of the IOL master or something like that. Is it okay? Yes, it is fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, you can still go with the online uh, calculators. But there is a difference between the two, especially in these irregular corneas. The difference slightly stands out more uh, as compared to regular scans, regular cataract surgeries, because the actual measurement of the cornea is always a little more superior to the theoretical assumption of the posterior cornea. Uh, I think with that said, uh, I think we can go to the next talk. Uh, one more point I want to 
uh, specify very very important this the epithelium in these kind of cases usually is irregular always put them on some kind of a lubricant make the surface more healthier automatically in one month believe me you'll see a beautiful change in uh, epithelial remodeling and you can see this change at one month when you do the scan and then you'll have much more reliable uh, scans and you'll have much better results uh, dr tejal you want to I think uh, Dr. Rohita has explained it very well. Now we move on to our next talk by Dr. Aishwarya. She'll be talking about uh, how we plan uh, toric can and IOL calculation in post-refractive surgeries. Dr. Aishwarya. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Today I'll be talking about patients who come with refractive surgery done. And you think that it is a usual formula that you can use for IOL power calculation, but it is, and you do a beautiful surgery, but eventually you decide that, oh, patient is unhappy because there is a refractive surprise. So the lesson number one is that basics don't change for post-refractive surgery eyes, but every eye is unique. Once we keep that in mind, we have to remember that in post-RK eyes, like Dr. Rohita mentioned, that the ratio of the posterior to anterior corneal radii is greater in the central zone and smaller in the paracentral zone. You have an irregular cornea to start with, and there is going to be diurinal uh, fluctuation uh, which occurs as a result of hypoxia from lid closure leading to edema, leading to hyperopic shift when the patient wakes up. So eventually the early morning scans are going to be better. In post LASIK eyes, you have to first of all decide what kind of LASIK was done. Was it myopic LASIK? Was it hyperopic LASIK? Was it pressed by LASIK? Or it is a decentered ablation that you are dealing with. Having said this, Think about post-smile eyes. Right now, you may not be getting a lot of patients, but as of now, the studies which are available, in 2015, one study came out which said that post-operative higher-order ablations were much lower after smile as compared to LASIK, and after smile, the sagittal curvature were constant for the central 4 millimeter diameter in contrast to LASIK, and featured over a 5 millimeter zone on the corneal, on the total cornea, FS LASIK induced more coma higher aberration of around 0 0.13 as compared to smile. With this thing, lesson number two, the preoperative workup is quite essentially. You have to look at the slit lamp fungus examination, the number of RK cuts, how is the LASIK flap, how many corneal opacities, is there any NVI, is there any ZD, is there any phacodonosis, look for black and hypermature cataracts, look for dilated fundus examination, any diabetic retinopathy, any vitreous hemorrhage, any retinal detachment, all need to be catered to. With that, like Dr. Nareen mentioned about dry eye evaluation, in our setup, we do a thorough evaluation which comes from symptoms, the Shermer strips, the T-butt, the OSTI score. Once it is noted down, the treatment is given and the resolution happens. The epithelial mapping, mebography, Shermer's test and T-butt all are noted down. The therapy is tablet doxy along with some steroids, along with sodium hyaluronate eye drops, with cyclosporin eye drops. The treatment is for one month and after that, you get better regularized corneas. Now, coming to the corneal topography uh, scans, we have already spoken about the EKR map and the refractive 4 map, so I'll not go details into that. We have to remember one thing, that how the EKR map has to look. If only by visual uh, assessment you have to see that if a good EKR map has to good look something like a peak with a narrow base, and if you have a bad EKR map, you have multiple peaks and broad base or both. Please remember that for both myopic and hyperopic LASIK, 4.5 mm zone has high correlation with the central corneal power. With decentered ablation, if you have a patient like that, the typical case presentation will have a decentered ablation zone along with increased higher ablation along with a tail on point spread function with reduced best BCVA that improves only with gas permeable lenses along with a cylindrical measurement on auto refraction and wavefront that differs from manifest refraction. Also, also a history of reduced vision immediately after surgery that fails to improve with time. That is what you will get. Now the corneal meridian connecting the ablation zone central to pupil center is the most affected as it lies in the transition zone between the maximal to the minimal diaphoretic powers. With this in mind, what we believe is that we have to treat the irregular cornea or the decentered ablation and do incomplete and also incomplete ablation if it is present. Eczema laser, do the ablation, regularize the cornea. It improves the central corneal symmetry, but it does not correct refractive error. 
So conventionally, we know that IOL can be inserted after secondary LASIK or surface ablation. We can have an altered mean K value, and but this will result in unpredictable shift and refraction. Today, we do TCAT. Now, TCAT is basically like if you have a decentered ablation, patient is already having astigmatism, glare, and halos. Without treatment, you give even a monofocal IOL, patient is going to be super unhappy. What you do is you go for a trial of RGP contact lenses, see if there is no improvement, go for monofocal IOLs. But if you see that there is improvement in visual quality, if you see that corneal regularization will benefit, do a TCAT, do IOL power calculation, and then you can even go for a multifocal diffractive IOL implantation with this. Our protocol has been corneal customization before cataract surgery, and we've published two uh, beautiful papers regarding the same. Lesson number three. Post-refractive surgery, the corneas which have issues which influence the IL power calculations and outcomes. post archi corneas, I have already mentioned this, that irregular astigmatism with smaller optical zones will be present, with higher length, axial length, and often pre rk history will not be available. It is said that RK is a gift which keeps on giving. The hyperopia will keep on coming. post lasic corneas will have three kinds of errors, instrument error, where there will be an ag error in axial length measurement, there will be keratometers which will measure paracentral points at 3.2 millimeter, but in post myopic eyes, we can miss the central flatter zone, uh, overestimating the corneal power and hence an hyperoptic shift. You can have a refractive index error, ma'am has already mentioned that, and you can have a formula error. Here, one millimeter error in effective lens position can cause 1.5 diopter change in final refraction. Lesson number four, post RK and post LASIK eyes need individualized IOL calculations. You have multiple formulas, Barrett True K history with partial history, with no history, with double K holiday, Potwin Hill, Hagis formula, the online calculators, ASCRS power calculators. All these formulas have been proven, for example, in this particular study, which said that it is preferable to use the True K history or the True K partial history formula but good results are obtained in eyes where no refractive history is available by either using the true K, no history or Hague's formula as well. This approach that is like you are having this uh, formulas in a single machine, the biometric data from multiple devices are not required. It is a very big plus point here. And also here the post RK refraction is very important which has to be taken in the most hyperopic refraction on record for a particular eye, which I mentioned has to be early in the morning. And the inclusion of pre-RK data provides a small additional benefit, but it is not essential. This we've already talked about the ACRS calculator, and um, I'll not go into the details of this. Here we have to talk about the prior RK, that is the target refraction. Since this is a eye which will go into hyperopia later on also, a eight cut RK, you have to aim for minus 1, with 12 cut RK, minus 1.5, 16 at RK, minus 2, and so on and so forth. We can enter the values of EKR holiday map or the uh, or the atlas ring values, which is actually the correct method over here. But you can also go for the A constant, which is the planned IOL. So now, is there a difference between 2 RK and 2K LASIK PRK? Yes, it is different because it is employed for myopic or hyperopic LASIK as while the normal relationship between the anterior and posterior cornea is altered by RK, the change is less fundamental than that which occurs after laser vision correction. Coming to options of IL power calculations post LASIK, plethora of uh, a lot of hard work has gone into these formulas. I'll talk a little bit about our Hagis L formula. In Hagis L formula, we have two versions. One is a Hagis L and Hagis L hyperopic version. The only difference between the two is the hyperopic version of Hagis L first calculates a new corneal radius based on the myopic Hagis L algorithm. Now, Hagis L formula corrects the IL value of corneal radius. You can go to effective equi uh, equivalent corneal power is taken, subtract 0.35 to allow for ELP prediction error, reconvert into effective radius of RI of 1.3315 and enter in the regular Hagis formula. This formula has also been uh, known to be accurate for predicting IL power in Asian patients who had pre previous myopic LASIK PRK with little variation and accuracy. So these are the EKR values that we have entered in the central uh, atlas ring values. 
and uh, all the other formulas which have been used are entered over here. This is the hyperopic classic PRK formula. But you can see that these uh, calculators are having multi-formula approach. We can go to Barrett-Truke formula, which we have already spoken about. And uh, TK is very beneficial because it does not reply, uh, rely on assumptions on the posterior surface, but is a me measurement of total corneal power, taking actual posterior corneal curvatures into consideration. Now, with this TK, we have three formulas, that is Barrett-TK Universal 2, Barrett-TK Toric, and Barrett-2K with TK. But do you think that only one machine has this? No. We have all other SSOCT biometers, which are new in uh, our armenpentarium, and this is Lenstar, Star 900, IL Master 700, Anterior and Argos biometer, which also deal with Barrett-2K formulas as well. Barrett-2K formula for prior myopic or hyperopic lasic, this is the formula which we can use from online and we also have the 2K toric calculator. Coming to lesson number 5, selection of aisles needs chair time. Now patient needs counseling, we have to see what kind of work they do, what kind of a personality they have and we have to counsel about the procedure, the risk benefits and the neuro adaptation and also take informed consent. We have to also understand how much they are willing to use glasses or not. Now, trifocals in post-myopic LASIK, when to do and when not to do. We have to think about the realistic expectations versus the unrealistic expectations. Angle alpha is very important. It has to be less than 0.5 if you want to implant a trifocal. HOA, again, less than 0.5. Has to have a normal retina. And like we have mentioned, dry eye needs to be treated. And if there is an irregular corneal surface, the TCAT regularization should be done. With this in mind, higher order abrasions which IOL would you prefer? You can go for a bifocal diffractive that is Restore, Alcon or Technus diffractive multifocal IOL or you can go for a diffractive trifocal IOLs for example, Alcon Panoptics and Technus Synergy OptiBlue and AT Lisa Tri. If you have of course higher order abrasions which are more than 0.5 and coma is more than 0.35, going for monofocal and toric monofocal makes sense. Angle Alpha also holds a very special place uh, angle alpha is something where one of the uh, papers mentioned that for patients with 0.4 mm or higher in angle alpha, the choice to implant a EDOF lens would be carefully considered. And EDOF lens are closest to this particular range that is around 0.3 to 0.4 because they give high quality of vision. They have uh, minimum visual ex uh, symptoms in low light and these patients will get a continuous range of good vision through intermediate and near. Contrast sensitivity, of course, if it is a good contrast sensitivity, you would like to go for a diffractive IOL as compared to if it is a poor one, you can go for EDOF and mon uh, multifocal ones, monofocal ones. And uh, coming to pupil size, now pupil size is extremely important because like this paper suggests that post-operative pupil size correlates with contrast in diffractive IOL implantation eyes, implanted eyes. Eyes with a pre-operative pupil size of 3 millimeter or less had worse contrast sensitivity than those with a pre-operative pupil size greater than 3. And But when these small pupils after surgery became larger, then the contrast sensitivity improved and was no longer significantly different from the larger pupil size. This is the formula that we have been using that I'll selection in post-refractive eyes. We have the myopic LASIK if it was there. And if you have more positive SA, you would like to implant a negative spherical IOL. And if it was a more negative essay in hyperopic classic, implant a positive spherical IOL, a spherical, uh, positive uh, spherical aberration IOL, and go for radial keratomide is present, then determine what kind of essay is present and accordingly implant the IOLs. Now lesson number six. These are special cases and they have to have special intraoperative and postoperative commitments. We have to avoid the intersection of the main entry and 2.2 or 2.24 uh, uh, incision can be preferred and clear corneal incisions can be placed peripherally between the two adjacent RK incisions. Stabilizing sutures can be used, scleral tunnel or scleral uh, incisions can be done and we have to remember to guard the glassic flap during the surgery if there is a glassic flap involved. And uh, the lowering of IOP has to happen during the surgery. It should not be very high or it should not be too low also. And uh, avoid high pressures during hydro dissection and we have to monitor bottle height. In the phaco emulsification part, when it comes to post-lastic eyes, 
Guarding the flaccid flap is actually one of the prior uh, most important things that we should do. And also sudden deepening of anterior chamber may cause discomfort to the patient. Intracameral lignocaine is helpful with the lifting of RS with cannula in these cases. Surgical pulse, of course, the central CCC is very important with a good caps, uh, with a good uh, cataract surgery. You can implant a capsular tension ring along with so that you can have stability of back and centration of IL is very important because as we know that the, if there is a decentered rexis, there can be tilting of IOL uh, leading to dysphotopsia and visual acuity. So words of caution, realistic expectations, quality of vision to be explained, longer period of stabilization, fluctuation of vision may happen, and there can be greater chance of RK incision splitting open at the time of a surgery or towards the end of the procedure. Sutures and fibrin glue may be required during this thing, uh, during the surgery. And if you have a post classic patient cataract surgery, again, glasses, we need to discuss that. Re we have to remember the long axial length posterior segment um, retinal changes. If there are any HOAs, we have to remember what sh uh, we have to tell about the patient that why we are going for a particular IOL. We can talk about enhancement secondary IOL implantation if that thing exists. If monovision was done for LASIK, then we have to explain which vision will be expected now. And of course, look for the retropulsion syndrome and um, avoid sudden decompression of the anterior chamber. For post smile eyes, all these things remain the same except for the fact that maybe ray tracing calculations have been found to be probably better in these cases. I'll talk about this in the recent studies. Now, recent studies, we have found that Holiday 2 formula have performed well, Barrett 2K formula have performed well. And in this particular study where total keratometry in IL power calculations with previous lens refractive surgery was done, it was found that uh, posterior corneal values and post laser eye, uh, that in the accuracy of these IL calculations in post laser eyes can be improved by addition of the posterior corneal values. These are the scans which, uh, these are the uh, records which show that Barrett 2K, TK actually performed quite well for both post hyperopic and post myopic LASIK. Some studies have also shown that if you have post RK eyes with pre RK refraction, then Barrett 2K history formula is better. If you have no uh, refraction present, then going for no history formula of Barrett 2K or Hages formula or OCT based or uh, ASCRS calculated average all works better than Portman Hill, SRKT, Hoffer Q and Holiday formulas. If people say that in post smile eyes we cannot implant multifocal IOLs, then uh, a study was published where uh, a trifocal multifocal IOL of AT LISA was implanted and patient was pretty happy with the result. So I think it is all about choosing the right patient for these cases. In uh, post smile eyes, theoretical models have been discussed earlier and uh, even they have uh, discussed that clinical history, if you don't have it, then you can go for Portman Hill and Barrett 2K. But if you have clinical history present, then Barrett 2K formula with masket formula can also work well for the patients. This particular study is a real uh, life study where total 11 eyes of 7 patients were included after mean follow-up of smile of 2 plus 1 month and a mean follow-up after cataract surgery of around 8, 11, 8 plus minus 11 months. And they found that physical ray tracing should be employed for IL power calculation. Here they use the Oculix software for doing the physical ray tracing and they f found that this was better as compared to the formulas which were Portman Hill the Masket, but they should be ideally compared and then decided what we have to do. Now coming to the last uh, lesson, which is about real life scenarios, I'll talk about a post classic patient. This was a 46 year old gentleman who came with both eyes myopic LASIK done in 2012. Uh, the right eye was having vision of uh, UDVA 618 and left eye 618 again. BC was 6 by 9 and 615. Both eyes had nucleus crisis growth grade uh, 2. Here, the higher order of patients was slightly uh, on the higher side, 0 0.6 in the right eye. And also, the EKR map showed a decent uh, uh, point curve over here. But uh, this was uh, in the left eye also, the higher order of patients were 1.39. So it was decided not to go for a trifocal or a multifocal lens, but we decided to go for a vivity lens. Now, in vivity uh, lens, we did both the scans, that is the IL master scan and the lens star scan. In the right eye, we found that it was around 17.5 is what we were getting with Barrett TK2K formula using the IL master. And in the left eye, we got 17.5. 
Similarly, in the length star, we got that it, in the right eye was plus 18 and in the left eye it was uh, close to 18.5 in the left eye. Now, let's see what the surgeon did. Surgeon implanted right eye vivity plus 18 and left eye 18.5. Now, Barrett 2K no history formula had suggested something like 17.78 for the right eye and 18.15 for the left eye. So you can see that the difference between these three formulas, be it the previous one, uh, these two and the next two are very, very close by. But what is actually giving 6 by 6 is probably something which is closer to the formulas which are uh, closer to Barrett TK 2K and as compared to that, in the left eye, when the uh, slightly higher power uh, IL was added, plus 18.5, we got a minus 0 0.75 diopter spherical as a residue. So probably this explains what we have been talking till now, how small little changes can make a difference to the patient's vision. So take home vision, uh, take home message for this uh, talk is that post LVC cataract, chair time and history taking is essential. We have to decide which formula which will work depending on the machines that you have. Barrett Truke has given good results in post LVC eyes. And ASA calculators are also equally good for many formulae to choose and compare from and they work well. Surgical expertise with IL choice is very important and exciting studies are still going on and we are still learning every day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ashura. So I think like she mentioned, see in terms of decision of uh, IOLs in these kind of post-diffractive eyes, do not shy away from uh, non-diffractive uh, EDOF IOLs. They do really well, including a trifocal also. Okay, if you're planning a trifocal, your inclusion criteria is the same. I'm sure you've seen one slide where she showed, you know, how much the higher diabration should be, how much the uh, angle alpha should be, and so on and so forth. There are full inclusion criteria for a trifocal was given, right? Trifocal, or you can use a term called as a diffractive presbyopic lens. Anything which is a diffractive, you have to follow the criteria what mentioned, what, what she had mentioned. If by chance they, uh, if it is not suitable that criteria, then you can go with a non-diffractive press biopic lens. The industry is completely uh, confused. Uh, not just the doctors, including patients, everybody. Like, uh, you know, with the eat off, uh, diffractive eat off, uh, non-diffractive eat off, then you have enhanced monofocal. So, so I think just to make it very, very simple, you have a diffractive presbyopic lens and a non-diffractive presbyopic lens, period. That's it. There are only two kinds of presbyopic lens. Keep that in mind. And then the counseling becomes easier, your workup, selection, everything becomes so much more easier. Okay? And uh, always, always remember, do not shy away if the patient is affordable and willing. Uh, do not shy away from regularizing the cornea before you do the treatment. The outcomes is uh, the quality of vision, what you're delivering to the patient. Even if you're doing a monofocal <coughs> is really good. Uh, like the previous speaker, Dr. Rohit also was, uh, was telling about uh, the keratoconic eyes. What is very, very important is when it comes, just have a look if the cone is centered or decentered. Okay? So if it is a decentered cone, just by putting rings, you can bring it to the center. That way, not just your monofocal IOLs, even your toric calculation and accuracy significantly goes up. And it becomes so much more easier. Okay? Just keep these uh, points in mind. And uh, maybe we can go to a, a next talk uh, by Dr. Tejal. Basically, she'll be talking about multiple calculation and multiple understanding in cataracts needing toric IOL. Dr. Tejal. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Nareen. So I'll be discussing about when we need to implant a toric IOL and what are the considerations that we need to take into account. So when do we implant toric? When do we plan in case of stable keratoconus, when there's regular astigmatism starting from plus or minus 0.75? You can even customize your astigmatic IOLs up to uh, 15 diopters and even post uh, PK or even when a patient is choosing a premium IOL, you would want to give, make sure that, you know, there is no residual error at all. So in these patients, it's always better to do a detailed evaluation and plan a trifocal toric IOL. So what are the challenges that we face? Mainly deciding what to correct, optimizing the calculation, making sure there is minimal surgically induced astigmatism and to make a note of post-operative rotation. So how do we optimize the toric uh, calculation? So clinically, we do a refraction slit lamp 
dilated fundus and a tear film status needs to be evaluated. We do a routine topography, an optical biometry is done. Also, we make a note of aberometry uh, in these patients. Out of all of these, the most neglected part would be the tear film status, but perhaps it's one of the most important things, I would say, because tear film is the first refractive index, and sometimes we tend to neglect it or, you know, we feel it does not have that much of an impact, but no, it does play a very important role in these IOL calculations and aberrations. So if you treat the tear film accordingly, say patient has an MGD or aqueous deficient dry eye, you grade the dry eye accordingly, mild, moderate, severe, give a good lubricant for a month, and then call the patient back, repeat the scans, and then recalculate, and you will actually see the difference in the epithelial surface also. But post-op, if you do not treat the tear film and then you do a surgery, patient will always come back with a lot of aberrations and patient will always be unhappy. So it's always better to make a note of the tear film status and then go ahead with surgery. So current, we have a lot of uh, online calculators available, and uh, but the commonly used formula is the barrett toric calculator because it's very important to calculate the posterior corneal astigmatism because only if you take the anterior cornea, then you'll be overcorrecting the white uh, uh, with the rural astigmatism and undercorrecting the uh, against the rural astigmatism. So, what are the commonly used calculators? All these are available online. So, we have the Alcon online toric calculator, which uses the barrett toric calculator formula. Then we have the Technus, which uses the Holiday 1 formula. So these values have to be put into the calculator. And the uh, calculators, depending on which lens you choose, they will tell you the axis and the lens that you need to put place in these patients. So you have the Zeiss calculator, which will take the keratometry and the total keratometry into account. And we have our care group Acreol toric calculator, wherein you need to put the K values from the IOL master, not the TK. We need to put the uh, K values and the surgical, uh, surgeon specific SIA to get the IOL and the access for these patients. So there's another interesting thing that is there, that is the integrated K reading. So Dr. Barrett came up with this where you take measurements from three different machines, so two biometers and one topographer. So when the K value is taken from three different machines, we call it the median K. Now suppose you do not have three machines, you have just two machines, and when you take readings from just the two machines, then you call it the mean K reading, but still the median would be better. So you take from the IOL master, lens star, and the pentacam. This has proven to be more uh, efficient. The residual spherical and the astigmatism uh, power has been very good. So it's better to use uh, the integrated K value. So if you go to the online, these all are freely available. So if you go online and type Barrett Toric Calculator, you get the K calculator below. So you can see that you can enter all the three values. So the top two, if you can see the cursor, the, these two are the biometers and the down is the topographer. So once you enter the values, the system automatically incorporates the actual K into your calculator. So you don't have to decide which K value you need to put. If you need, if your IOL master is better or Pentacam is better, we don't have to choose that. The calculator by itself chooses and it automatically incorporates it into the calculator and to your calculation. So there have been studies which says that it is statistically significant and comparable to the Barrett calculator. So how do we, what do we do post-surgically? Now patient, how do we assess if patient has residual astigmatism or if there is any misalignment in the axis that I have placed? For these, they have multiple evaluation that can be done. So we have our eye trace. So eye trace is a machine which displays the internal astigmatism and it will also tell you how far off the alignment we are and it will tell the exact degree of rotation. So what is the uh, lens placement and what is the rotation that has happened post-surgery? So if you need to realign, this is something it will tell you how much it, you, it is rotated by. So another important thing that is available online, it is called astigmatismfix.com. So this is a tool, again, where you can analyze post-operatively your residual astigmatism and how do you correct it. So once you put in all the patient data, information about the IOL that you have implanted, the what you have chosen, it will tell you the pre-op parameters and you need to put the post-op outcomes also. Depending on this, it will calculate and tell you the exact result. So if your IOL was placed in, uh, say, eight, uh, say 120 degrees, 
what is the axis that you need to rotate it and if you rotate it at this particular axis what will be the residual astigmatism this is something the astigmatic toric calculator analyzes for us so uh, we have been hypothetically doing a study so usually what happens when we take white to white we either take it in the vertical or in the horizontal uh, place so this is our research where we feel pentacam has the ability to take around 25 to 50 scans so when you take 25 scans in different meridian we found that wherever the white to white was the smallest that was the area of the steep axis. So we did a few, did a detailed evaluation on a few patients and we found that if the white to white was 67.7, if that was the lowest white to white, the steep axis was around 66. So out of these patients, 83% of our patients said that if the lower your uh, white to white, that's where the steep axis is going to lie. We are still working on it. So once we have a clear cut data on this, we'll be able to explain it better. So coming to a case example about these calculators, so this is how it is, a patient comes with a cataract, we do a detailed evaluation, we do a calculation, get the topography done, and once we put all the values in the online calculator, you can choose your lens, whatever lens you choose, you need to put in that particular company IOL calculator, and you can, you can see that it is comparable to your IOL master values also. So once you do that, you place the lens and this patient was 6'6 vision and this was T2 we had placed Alcon IQ. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tejal. So, uh, w one of the things I think which you, I think all of us have been continuously hearing is Barrett's. So, I think at least one take home message is, is simple. If you're getting confused with all the formulas in the market, just stick to one formula, Barrett's, you'll do really well, okay? The other important point or the question which we keep hearing from a lot of doctors is, see, see doctor, we don't have all these high-end machines to calculate the epithelium. Tell me something else. How do I look at it? How do I treat it? How do I know that it is, is it irregular or not? It's a simple way. Let's say uh, if you have certain scans and it's the every time you do the scan, it's the results are different. Usually the surface is not good, okay? So what you need to do is, if it's getting multiple scans like this, uh, start the patient, I mean treat the patient for the lids, the surface and review in one month, you'll realize automatically your scans are more reliable. Every time you repeat it, you'll get more reliable scans. So rest assured that the epithelium become, would have become regularized by itself, okay? And uh, so, the, so basically, you know, and, and, and one of the th point which I wanted to mention what is very, very interesting in the study which we did uh, on uh, the white to white, this is an extremely, extremely useful tool, especially in keratoconus, right? Now, when we do comparison of results, let's say I've done one scan now and in six months and we are overlapping the two scans and seeing the difference. Now, even the slightest rotation, the progression and everything can completely change, right? It's not that the, 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 the you know, the, the orientation of the scan is perfectly, uh, perfect every time. But with this tool, you can make sure that the overlapping is perfect every time. Okay? So it's a very interesting which uh, we should be uh, publishing the same uh, soon. But uh, I, we just wanted to give a glimpse of the study uh, which is going to completely change how we look at and treat uh, these kind of uh, astigmatism. Um, so I think moving forward, uh, so we have Dr. Anuj uh, who will be uh, talking about new age EDOF lenses and uh, how do we titrate the requirement. Thank you, Dr. Naren. I'm going to be talking about EDOF lenses. My talk will be divided primarily into two parts. First, I'll be talking a little bit about the EDOF lenses and then about how we end up titrating or mixing and matches based on what the patient wants. So we begin with a little bit of basics. Depth of field and depth of focus is something that we end up using interchangeably, but it's not. Depth of field is what is in the field, so in front of the lens. And depth of focus is at the retina. So when the object moves, the focus falls a little ahead of the retina or a little behind. So depth of focus is what the EDOF lenses work on. EDOF lenses have come up as a new modification in terms of the IOL power technology. We, used, we all began with monofocals and then we went on to bifocals and trifocals and EDOF lenses over time have now 
filled in the gap for the period where the patients used to have a lot of dysphotoptic symptoms and to take care of that, EDOF lenses came into the picture and with the increased importance of intermediate vision, EDOF lenses became more significant. There are multiple types of EDOF lenses. EDOF comes basically just from extension of the depth of focus. Instead of a point focus, it extends the depth of focus of the patient. It can be done through different mechanisms. It could be through diffractive, through refractive, through hybrid diffractive plus refractive technology, through small aperture technology, and as well as through the monofocal EDOF lenses by changing the aspherity of the lens that leads to SA induced induced SA related increased depth of focus. I'll be talking a little bit about each of these technologies. So, so if you look at the chart now here, uh, can you go back, Dr. Anuj? The previous one, yeah. So like I was mentioning about diffractive and refractive, right? So if you look in this bracket of uh, lenses, the diffractive and hybrid are actually just diffractive, finished. Okay, it's just one. It has those rings, so that means it's a diffractive. And then non-diffractive, it comes into all these enhanced monofocal, small aperture, uh, you know, refractive. All these are non-diffractive. So this way you can make it much more simpler in terms of classification. Please go ahead. These are the different... IOLs that we have available in our entire armamentarium based on based on the mechanism with which they act. What happens in refractive? We always keep talking about refractive and diffractive. Refractive may, what happens is, there are different zones. So the lens creates different focal points. So zone 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, when the rays of light pass through the different zones, they will focus at those respective focal points. And this, there's a smooth transition between the zones, which will lead to the smooth transition in terms of effect, effectivity of uh, vision across the different ranges. One issue of this is that it gets limited by pupil diameter. Compared to this, because whichever zone through which the light is passing, that is the zone from where the focus will be uh, placed on the retina. The wavefront modifying design of the Vivity therefore falls under the non-diffractive or the refractive category, whereby the entire wavefront is modified. In diffractive, on the other hand, it works on the Huygens Fresnel principle and through apodization, it splits the light. In refractive, there is no splitting of light, different lights falling on different zones, leading to different focal points. In diffractive, D, there is splitting of the light. That is what gives rise to the glare and halo. As you can see in the image, uh, the surrounding area where the light is focused, that gives rise to the glare and halo. And base apodization is where the height of the steps in terms of uh, the the steps that we can see, when the height is altered, that is apodization because that gives rise to what the defocus curve of the respective lens will be. Then there are hybrid refractive diffractive like the Synergy lens which have a central zone, uh, the, will have a 3.5 mm diameter of a diffractive element and a refractive zone as well as the aspheric element. So when you combine it, since there are diffractive zones, these patients will also experience much higher glare and halo because of the diffraction. Synergy works on the echolette design. From the edges, it does split the rays, but it has the refractive element. That is why it is a combination of a, uh, it qualifies as a trifocal as well as an EDOF. In pinhole designs, just like the name suggests, um, all the unfocused rays are blocked and only the focused rays fall on the retina. And this happens at the expense of less light entering the eye. So only through the pinhole, light will end up reaching the eye. But since through the pinhole, all the rays are anyways focused, the patient will have an extended depth of focus in that entire zone. The SA is a higher order aberration whereby the central and the peripheral rays end up focusing at different points. So it kind of creates a Strum's conoid. So instead of creating a, a point focus, it creates a line focus. And through that line focus, so anywhere along the line, if the retina is, uh, the retina is placed anywhere along the line, the patient will be able to see the object that is there. And that is how it enhances the depth of focus. 
important consideration ends up being patient selection. You don't, you can't use uh, a diffractive, a diffractive kind of a lens in patient who already has higher order abrasion because he's already prone, just like Dr. Narain said, they are already prone to uh, glares and halos. When you put in a diffractive lens in such a patient, there will be further higher order abrasions and it'll worsen the patient's vision. Since EDOFs have non-diffractive uh, lenses are the ones that can be used in patients with post-refractive surgery if their higher order abrasions are within the normal limit. And uh, one very important thing to take into consideration here is that if the patient has astigmatism but is not willing for a toric aisle implantation, do not implant an EDOF for a trifocal lens because that will lead to the loss of the trifocality or the loss of the depth of focus. Even when you're planning like a monovision or a micro monovision, if the patient is not willing for toric correction, then because of the poor unaided distance vision, because of the astigmatism the patient has, the beneficial effect of the micro monovision in terms of near vision will be lost. And it will come at the cost of compromised distance vision. So that is why even in micro monovision, monovision, you should go ahead with implanting a toric lens. And if the patient is not willing for a toric lens, don't implant an EDOF or a trifocal. Having said that, EDOF lenses, because of their technology, they end up, because of how the light focus on the retina, these lenses are a little better in terms of tolerating refractive surprises. Trifocal, trifocal lenses lose their trifocality with residual refractive error. So when you're planning a trifocal lens or an EDOF lens, um, what is most important is targeting that emetropia initially. Uh, if the patient ends up having residual refractive error, your trifocal lens will mean nothing. The patient will not even be able to see near well. This extension of the depth of focus that comes in the EDOF lenses or uh, the multiple focal points that come in the trifocal lenses, it comes at the cost of contrast since the amount of light going into the eye is the same, even when, when you consider taking in something and giving a beneficial effect of the near vision, it will come at the cost of something. So it comes at the cost of contrast, as you can see in the graphs. Titrating the EDOF depends upon two things. What is it that the patient wants? What working distance it is that the patient wants? And the defocus curves of the respective lenses. So when you're titrating for, say, a Vivity IOL, the non-dominant eye, considering that 0 0.2 logmar is where vision is good enough, based on the defocus curves, we can see that uh, for a Vivity, you can, to get a vision of, say, within 0 0.2 logmar based on the FDA, FDA approval defocus curves, for a working distance of 40 centimeters, the target myopia should be 0 0.7 diopter sphere because the VVT provides an additional depth of focus of up to 1.5 diopters. So based on the defocus curves, you have to titrate which EDOF lens to put or which lens you can implant in the patient. Similarly, for eye hands, since the enhancement in the depth of focus of the eye hands is only up to 0.5 or 0.75, the target myopia that you will require for the other eye to give the patient good binocular near vision will be higher, say up to target myopia in the non-dominant eye of up to 1 to 1.25 diopter sphere. You can also combine technologies in terms of monofocal IOLs in one eye and a trifocal or an EDOF in the other eye or a trifocal in one eye and an EDOF in the other eye. All of this will also depend upon the defocus curves of the respective lenses. There are multiple papers that prove that you can combine different technologies and the patient do end up becoming happy, especially this is only if the patient really requires. If the patient has come with a monofocal in one eye and has come asking for a near, near vision in the other eye and binocular spectacle independence, you can go ahead with an EDOF lens. There are studies that also talk about using a trifocal lens and thus you can mix and match IOLs. With Toric EDOFs, with, when you're considering micro-monovision, you should be sure that you put a toric lens if the patient has residual astigmatism, like I mentioned earlier, because if not, then the distance vision will get compromised and the benefit that you're getting with micro-monovision will get compromised. 
So when you, if in the first eye you've gone and gotten emetropia in right eye with a monofocal lens, the SN60 WF, and uh, the patient wants intermediate vision, you can plan a vivity in the other eye with target of emetropia. That will, with the left eye, you can see that the patient will end up having up to 0.2 with uh, with a target of, with targeting of emetropia. But if the patient wants near vision as well, then in the other eye, you should plan vivity with a target of minus 0 0.75. So this titration will depend upon the defocus curves of the lenses that you're trying to implant. So this is a case which was normal. We planned emetropia in one eye and the patient wanted uh, near vision as well. So we went ahead with a vivity lens and we planned micro mono vision in the other eye. And uh, the patient ended up having good vision across all range of distances. And this is another patient where we planned a toric lens in the other eye with a vivity with micro mono vision. And this patient also had good binocular uh, distance intermediate and near vision and was happy for all range of distances. Thank you. See, uh, w one of the, the most important, I would say, among all these talks for a successful prospective lens implantation is counseling. This is the, the most important part. Please do not underestimate it. You really need to talk to the patient and please do not promise you will be completely spectacle independent. That word shouldn't be there. You will never require glasses. All these words should never come. Whenever you're counseling your patients, let's say if they're going with a trifocal patient, I mean trifocal IOL, then what you tell the patient is most of the time at all distances, you won't require glasses. Okay? This is a simple term at all distances, I mean at least most of the time at all distances you won't require glasses. Please use the same words so that the expect I mean acceptance is better. The other thing is what you have to add to this point is let's say uh, you know you have these patients no 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 very small when the lighting is not good I can't see that well for near right. What is your answer for this is for these lenses to work really well light is very very crucial okay it's a very simple play of words for this lens to work really well light is very important so that is why make sure you read in good lighting so this will solve all the issue <laughs> if you just simply say no use more light use this then they'll say no why I have to use they'll start questioning you just have to say that's how the lens works light is very important for its functioning simple period and uh, for EDA firewalls, always uh, say that you patient, uh, tell the patient that the near vision is better than a monofocal, uh, but still you'll require uh, glasses for near. Even though you're planning a micro mono vision and trying to make them independent bilaterally, bilaterally for distance and all dif distances, do not promise that in the beginning. You say that you require probably for reading purpose. Then once you finish one of the eyes and the patient's very happy for distance, when you're applying the other eye, then you just crop up the question about what if you, are you interested in this micro mono vision where we target the other eye a little more near. So that time when you get that and you hit the target and you binocularly the patient's doing really fell near, he felt like you're giving something that is completely extra, right? So you under promised and you're over delivered. So the patient is extremely, extremely happy. So these small tips and uh, how you counsel the patient is very important in these scenarios. If anyone, uh, we thought we'll keep the questions at the very end of the session. If anyone has any questions from uh, the audience, uh, anything and all from all the talks, what is spoken before, please, uh, we are open for questions. Uh, I think if not, uh, as promised, we'll end the session uh, even sparing five minutes. No, 10 minutes. Okay, so that, five minutes, okay. So we are ahead of time. Uh, we thank uh, AOS for giving, giving all of us this opportunity and we wish you all the very best uh, for all the future sessions. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone.